as you guys can see on the, on the, the big screen, so I don't even need my glasses to introduce our next speaker, which is Federico Campanini. And we uh, talk about uh, some recent results on pretorsion theories in extensive categories. The stage is yours. Thank you, Beppe, for the introduction. Can you all hear me? Or is it okay? And okay, so uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity of being here. Uh, the plan of this talk is actually to promote the notion of pretorsion theory. And uh, the main line of the talk will be to first recall something about torsion theories and then see how to generalize this notion into the notion of pretorsion theory. And then we uh, see some examples in the context of extensive categories. And then uh, go back and try to associate to every pretorsion theory a uh, torsion theory, possibly in a universal way. And well, this is, of course, it's not an injunction. So uh, let me start with the definition of torsion theory, which is uh, well known, it was given by Dixon in 16. Uh, if we start from an abelian category, uh, okay, we have a pair of full uh, Rebitzel category, T and F. Uh, this form of torsion theory, if there are no morphisms between something in T and some from something in T to something in F, and for every uh, object in C, there is a short exact sequence like this with the first term in T and the last term in F. And of course, the terminology comes from the, um, the well-known examples in uh, billion groups, where we have torsion groups as torsion parts and torsion-free groups as torsion-free parts. And uh, okay, but actually, the, this condition of being for the category of being um, a billion is uh, is not necessary. We can just repeat the same definition in any pointed category. The only thing we need is to have the zero object. And in fact, there are several. Uh, examples in uh, out of the billion case we here we have two the first one is in the category of uh, commutative rings where we have the impotence rings as a torsion part and the reduced rings as a torsion free part here we have this short exact sequence for uh, every ring we have the impotent ideal which is a sub ring and uh, here the quotient and the second one is in the category of um, topological groups where we have the groups within discrete topology as torsion part and the house of group as torsion free part Okay, but what if we try to uh, do something in any category? So we want to remove the, the hypothesis to have a zero object. And well, of course, we have problems in, in both these conditions, right? Because we have problems here and also in the definition of, of a kind of short exact sequence. And so the first thing we want to do is to, okay, we start with any category and we two subcategories, T and F, and we can uh, allow a possible intersection, with what we call Z, which will form the class of trivial objects. And we say that a morphism is trivial if it factors through something in Z. So if this F is trivial if it factors through something that is in the, in the intersection of T and F. And the class of trivial morphisms is actually an ideal of morphisms in, in C, we denote it by three where ideal means that if we have a composition when one of the two is in the ideal, then the composition is, uh, is in the ideal. And of course, if Z is just the, the zero object in case of a pointed category, we, uh, this ideal is, is actually the ideal of zero morphisms. So now we can define kernels and co-kernels with respect to an ideal of morphisms. And the definition is uh, the same. We just replace Z everywhere with Z trivial. So, key is the Z kernel of F if this, co this composition is trivial, not zero this time. And every time we have another morphism such that this composition is trivial, then there exists, there exists a unique factorization here making this diagram commute. And of course, you can do the same thing for co-kernels, dually. And uh, short as that sequence is so a uh, sequence where F is the Z kernel of G and G is the Z co-kernel of, uh, of F. Uh, well, for the universal property, we actually have that uh, every kernel is a monomorphism and every co-kernel is an epimorphism, thanks to the uniqueness, of course. And okay, so now we have uh, here the definition and here we have the new one. So a pair TF is a pre-torsion theory if we replace zero with trivials everywhere, essentially. 
So there are no non-trivial morphisms from something in T to something in F. And for every X in C, there exists a Z sort of exact sequence like this, where the first term in T and the last term in, uh, in S. Okay, and actually we can uh, retrace many of the basic properties of uh, torsion theories, in, uh, also in this context. For instance, we have a torsion functor and a torsion free functor, which are basically given by, the, by a choice of the short exact sequence. We have two adjunctions, uh, we have the inclusion and the right adjoint, which is the torsion functor, and the torsion free functor is a, is a left adjoint of the inclusion. Uh, we have that in a, an object is in T, if and only if its torsion part is actually exists itself, the same for, for F. We also have the two of the three classes, their mind, the third one, in the sense that if we have that there are no non trivial morphism from a given object X into any uh, object in F, then this X must be in T, and uh, similarly for, uh, for F. And well, if we have a two composite morphisms and F is the, is the kernel of G, of course, F is an isomorphism uh, if and only if G is, uh, is trivial. So very basic uh, properties, which are essentially the same of uh, the case uh, in, of the pointed case. Okay, here we have a closure property. This is closed under extrema quotient, while F is closed under extrema monomorphisms. The three classes are all closed under retracts. Uh, the initial object is in T, the terminal object is in F, if they exist, of course, and in particular, if C is pointed, the zero object must be in, uh, in Z. And here we have, a, well, long stuff to say just that T is closed under subobjects, so T is hereditary, if and only if, uh, for any given subobject X of Y, the torsion part of X is just given by the intersection of X with the torsion part of Y. And, well, so these, are were very basic uh, properties, there were many more, but I want just to skip to uh, examples. All these examples will be of the extensive categories, but I will define extensive categories later because I'm interested in give you some examples of pre theory, not of extensive categories. So uh, the first one is in the category of pre-ordered set. So objects are just pre-orders, which are reflexive, reflexive and trusted relations. Morphisms are just monotone maps. And the pre theory here is given by uh, as torsion part, we have uh, equivalence relations, as torsion free parts, partial orders. So symmetric and asymmetric relations, if we intersect them, we get just the equalities. So the trivial objects are the uh, equality relations. And a short exact sequence for any given uh, pre-order is just uh, here we take as a subobject uh, the, the equivalence relation given by A is, is related to B, if only if A rho B and B rho A, and we here we perform the quotient and we define these as the anti-symmetric pre-order. And there is a topological counterpart of this example because indeed the category of pre-order set is isomorphic to the category of uh, Alexander's discrete um, topological spaces. Where Alexander's discrete means that we can intersect all uh, arbitrary family of opens and getting opens again. And so the corresponding pre torsion theory here is given by well, the torsion part of the partition spaces. So there are uh, spaces for which this is, there exists a partition, which is a basis for the, uh, for the space, and the torsion free part, the T0 spaces. And well, we can generalize this example in basically two ways. We can think about a pre order like a category with just one, uh, with at most one morphism between two objects. And so we have a generalization here in the category cut of both categories. We have here symmetric categories, which are those categories for which if there exists at least one morphism from X to Y, then there also exists a morphism in the other direction. And anti-symmetric categories, which are those for which if uh, there are morphism from X to Y and from Y to X, then the two objects must be equal. And of course, if we, if we consider intersection, we get just classes of monoids, so we have no morphism between uh, different objects. Or we can, this is another generalization in another direction, we can consider pre-orders internally to the category. So we can consider uh, the category of pre-orders internal to a given category. We require the category to be exact in order to have the pre-torsion theory like this. 
but actually since I said that um, all the sample will, uh, will have been of an extensive category, we actually have to require that this is a pretopos in order to get that this is an extensive category, but anyway, not important. Um, exactness is enough to have a pretorsion theory like this. And there is another production theory in CAT, which is given by uh, this one. So for the torsion part, we have the group points. And for torsion free part, the scleral categories. And if we intersect the two, of course, we get the, the category of them, which are just classes of groups. We have a short exact sequence of this form. So for every category, we take just the isomorphism of the category. And then the tricky part for that pretorsion theory is to define the, the torsion free part. What is this the equalizer of, of this thing, which is just a, a copy of the terminal category for every isomorphism in C in C, and we basically identify objects with which are isomorphic at the level of objects. But well, at the level of morphisms, uh, I think I can do a more picture. Um, we have a, when I think about a quotient, I I'm used to think about something which is smaller in some sense because I'm identifying uh, some stuffs which will become uh, equal in the in the quotient, so I will have mm, less stuffs in the in the quotient. But actually, this Q is bigger than C in some sense because if you have uh, something like X, Y, uh, Z, and W, F, and G, but F and G are not composable in C, but Y is isomorphic to Z then these two objects will be equal in Q. And so I have to uh, allow this composition. And so I will have a lot of more uh, morphisms in Q. So less objects, but more morphisms. And OK, and now we arrive to the definition of extensive category. A category is extensive if it has uh, all finite limits, finite sums of products which behaves well in terms of pullbacks in the following sense. If we have a diagram like this, where the bottom row is a sum, then the two squares are pullbacks if and only if this is the sum of A and B. Well, as I'm of the intensive category, I said, the topology of space, the category of uh, fine schemes, cut, any pre-topos or topos is an extensive category. And if C is extensive, then also the internal pre-orders and internal categories are extensive as well. Uh, well, it's just basic properties of the extensive category. The initial object is strict. Uh, finite product distribute over sums. Or LS is joint sums, meaning that the co-projections into the co-product are actually more And the intersection of the two is, um, is the initial object. And in particular, this diagram is both a pullback and a push out. And this last property allows us to define or to consider complemented subobjects in a, in an extensive category. So we start with an object X, A is a, a subobject of X. We can say that A is complemented if there exists B such that A plus B is equal to X. If this is the case, then also A intersect with B will be zero. And okay, in extensive categories, T is close on the products while F is closed under complemented subobjects. And here we have a condition for Z to be closed under complemented subobjects, which is just that trivial morphisms are stable under pullback along projections. And an important property, maybe I will say it again later, is that if T is closed under complemented subobjects, then all the three classes are closed under complemented subobjects. Uh, and co-products. So we will automatically get that all the classes are closed under what we are interested in, which is co-products and complemented subobjects. And now I want to try to go back to torsion theory. So I'm wondering if there's a way to associate to a pre-torsion theory, uh, a torsion theory. So the idea of course is to, uh, is to try to define a congruence in order to identify all trivial objects into the zero object, okay? But indeed, and of course we want this, uh, this kind of, mm, uh, just this congress and this quotient to send the, the pre-torsion into a torsion theory. 
Okay. But of course, there's no way to define a congruence in L in order to get something like this because uh, since zero is strict, we have no morphisms from one to zero. And so there's no way to uh, identify these two objects, which are both in, uh, in Z. So the idea is to first enlarge a bit the category L. Oh, well, here we have the, the, the definition of tertiary theory functor, which is just uh, a way to say precisely what this last line means. Uh, well, it's just a functor from a category with a pre torsion theory into a category with a torsion theory, so a point category with a torsion theory. And this functor has to preserve the, the data. So the torsion theory has to go into the torsion, theory, torsion part to the torsion part, torsion free part to the torsion free part. And it has also to preserve the, the canonical short exact sequences. Uh, okay, so here we are uh, enlarging a bit the, the category L, just at the level of morphisms. We consider partial morphisms, which are uh, uh, roofs, I would say. So here we have a subobject, um, a morphism from X to Y is uh, this thing, so it's a subobject, a complemented subobject of X, and a morphism from, so partial morphism from a, a part of X, so from A to Y. And of course, we can compose to such morphisms. Uh, we have alpha F and beta G. We can compose just performing the pullback here, which is, uh, of course, well defined. And there is an inclusion functor of L into the partial morphisms, which is the identity at the level of objects. We are not adding any object at all. But we, and at the level of morphism, we just send F into the uh, identity and F. Now the category, this category is pointed, but the Z object is given by the initial object in L. And here we have the, the unique morphism from any object X into zero, and here the unique morphism from zero into X. Uh, these are unique because of the, because of the zero is three, actually. And so now here we can define a congruence in the partial orders. Uh, okay. We say that two morphisms alpha one, F one, and alpha two, F two are um, congruent if there exists such a, a diagram where C is a subobject both of A one and A two, and F one and F two agree on C. So this condition here. We also require that C is complemented. In particular, that C one is uh, the complement of A one, uh, sorry, C one C is the complement of C in A one, and C two C is the complement of uh, C in A2. And we also require that on the complement, the morphisms are trivial. So F1 restricted to C1 is trivial, and F2 restricted to C2C to C is trivial. Um, so basically, we require that two morphisms agree where they are all defined, and they are trivial where they are not defined together. And so we have an inclusion to L into the partial morphisms. We have a congruence, so we go into uh, the, the stable category, which is the, this category here. And now we have our construction and our functor. We, yes, we have several results which are similar in the conclusions, but kind of different in the, in the hypothesis. This is my favorite one, uh, which, is with, which is if we start from a pretortion theory in an extensive category, and we assume that T is closed on the complemented subobjects. As we have said before, uh, this means that all the three classes are closed by complemented subobjects and coproducts. So, well, the simple category is well defined. Uh, and we have what we want at the level of trivial objects and trivial morphisms. So, they are precisely the objects and the morphisms that are sent to the zero objects and morphisms. And this functor preserves finite coproducts. It sends uh, Z kernels into kernels and shorted Z exact sequence into uh, genuine exact sequences. And the part for co-kernels is a bit more tricky and we have to require that all co-kernels exist in order to have that sigma sends Z co-kernels into kernels. But uh, 
the part of short is that sequence is enough to have a, a torsion theory function. Actually. Well, of course, another important thing is that the TNF is also a torsion theory sum, which is not mm, trivial. And, and also, we have this uh, universal property, which is that if we have a, a here is a Howard sigma, if we have any other G, which is a torsion functor, so it, X is a pointed category, category with a given torsion theory. Uh, if G is another torsion functor, which preserves finite coproducts, then there exists a unique factorization of G uh, into sigma. And well, that's it. Thank you for uh, your interesting talk. And, uh, and now it's time for questions and uh, or remarks or uh, comments. Anyone? Uh, hi. Uh, I had a question about Z kernels and co kernels. Yeah. Do they arise as like actual limits and colimits that you know of, or and oh, that's not the case? at least for a general pretorsion theory. I think that's not the case in mm. general, yes. Uh, I think it depends on the pro on property of Z, I guess. So. Other questions? If not, I have one thing to ask. Okay. Uh, in the case of pre-torsion theory, so before getting to torsion theories, uh, is there any uh, studied the structure of the, the category of the two categories of the pre-torsion theories, like a monoidal structure or something that you uh, are aware of? Not yet, no. There's nothing uh, in the direction. Yeah. Like, I think there is a possibility for this. Yeah, thank, you. thank you for the comment. Discuss. Yes, yes thank you. <laughs> Okay, 